my name's Tommy. This is my beautiful wife, Kayla. Um, this is going to be our podcast. We are going to talk dog training, entrepreneurship, marriage, veteran stuff, how not to kill your wife when you work with her, um, our husband, I guess, because you probably want to kill me more than I want to kill you. <laughs> so um, we are the owners of Modern Canine Solutions. We're a full spectrum dog training company in Warrington, Missouri. I'm going to introduce yourself. I'm Kayla, as Tommy already mentioned, I'm his wife. Um, I don't know. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Yeah. Where what? did this all start? Like, that's probably a good place to start. So being invited on multiple podcasts um, and talking, uh, this has been a lot of fun for me doing. And we've been asked by multiple people to do a podcast because of our backgrounds and doing the dog stuff. And apparently we're really good about being in front of people, which I guess we are. Um, I think it's the educating aspect. Like we've talked about, that's a huge thing that separates us in this industry is like being able to explain concepts to people and show them at the same time. Like, I feel like that's been, that's been the dream team thing. Just like we just talked to, um, Joey about with, yeah, you do the training and I can stand back. I remember the first time that that happened to you're like, Hey, that really worked. This next eval that we're doing, can you just talk while I work the leash so I can right. focus on the dog? Right. Then I don't get bit. So where did modern canine solutions start? So modern canine solutions originally was going to be a nonprofit. And the goal behind it was going to be doing public dog training for anybody. And then a portion of that would fund service dogs for veterans. Um, that didn't work out. Ended up going somewhere else and working for multiple other companies first. And then when we came back from Virginia, it was kind of a plug and play because we already had the logo. We already had the branding. We already had the image. We already had a Facebook page for it. Like it just flowed. Well, so back, like, there was a huge jump there. <laughs> like a five-year jump. Yeah. Well, so you talked about Modern Canine Solutions was originally a nonprofit. And then that didn't work out like the the donating service dogs to veterans or whatever. It was for everybody. But And I know you. And when I say that, I mean, you don't just give up. It's not like, a, okay, this isn't working. Like, I'm not making money. I'm not. So what was, like, what was it about that that you were like okay this isn't working like i'm gonna move on or do something different or was it truly not working well so it never got stood up it never officially got stood up because i went from dog school started the brand trained like two or three dogs and then off-leash canine st louis came out to me and said hey we want you to basically run and start our location in st louis and you won't have to do any of the business stuff. You'll just have to train dogs. And I was like, okay. Especially considering like, <laughs> I was so new in the dog world that I didn't have the ownership or the, the, the business ownership side of it locked down yet because I hadn't seen it. Mm -hmm. So when they came to me and said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna pay you to just train dogs and that's all you gotta do. I was like, okay, it's a no brainer. Let's gain some more experience first in the dog world before actually diving in on doing my own thing. I think some of that too, like one thing that we've talked about pretty frequently is the niching, like everybody with business talks about niching. And I think for us, it's been so difficult, even going through the coaching stuff that we have for the business, it's been so difficult to niche because it's almost like you cut yourself off from people. And so modern canine solutions being specifically geared towards service dogs and veterans is like, but I have this wealth of knowledge and all of this stuff that I can help so many other people, right? not just service dogs. So like knowing you and digging all the way down to the surface, like I think, I think that that was probably it. You don't like limited dog yourself. training is my niche. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Like it's, I can help so many people do so many things. Um, where do we go from here? <laughs> so now moving forward to where we are with the company, you know, you being 
in the dog world now for almost five years, four years. Oh my gosh, you blew my mind when we first got back together with the whole dog thing. Because I, I wasn't in the dog world professionally, right? I had Rax and Remy, my two little mutt pups. Um, and they were they were good dogs for pet dogs and me yeah. not having any idea what the heck I was doing. Like Remy had recall issues. He would get in his hound state and just kind of do his thing. And Rax, I didn't know how to deal with his drive, but they were good dogs. And then getting into our relationship and getting more involved on the professional side of things, I feel like I actually kind of, I kind of pulled back. Like I lost a lot of what I knew because I, I got caught up in the behavior science of it. I got caught up in what people say you need to do this and the A plus B equals C thing and completely backed off of the fluidity and the emotional relationship connection with the dog. Well, you do what most trainers do. You start one place and then you go the polar opposite and then you figure out that that doesn't completely work. So then you bounce back to the other complete polar opposite, the other direction. And then between those polar opposites, you find somewhere in the middle that balance that you flow in. That's like anything in life though. Correct. It's everything. But I feel like it's more ex- ex- exonified or, you know, it's more prevalent in the dog industry because you're dealing with another living creature. So as you progress through that, you're seeing, you know, let's say you're more on the positive side. You're seeing these happy go lucky dogs because they're getting fed all day long with treats and everything is great. And we're high pitched Mickey mouse voices but we're not getting anywhere because the dog doesn't build any duration, doesn't build any conf- well, maybe confidence, but there's Discipline. a lot of lacking because it's all positive. And then you start to see that and then you overcompensate and you go to the far right where it's all, you know, totalitarianism and you're, you know, lots of corrections and a lot of pressure. And then you start seeing these dogs that start shutting down. They might listen, they might have duration, they might comply, but you're missing a lot of what you had at the other option or the other side. So then eventually people start narrowing it down and you find a spot that's comfortable for you, for the dog, you get results. Everybody's happy. You're not shutting dogs down, but you're also not losing out on the training. Yeah. So there's that. I, I think that like I got so caught up in whether or not I was applying behavior theory and training theory properly that I was so down in the weeds. Like you tell me all the time, you're overthinking this, like just get in and just do it. It was almost like I got too deep into guilty knowledge and too deep into, and with me self-analyzing like it was just, am I applying the negatives properly? Am I, should I be rewarding here? Should I be correcting here? Like rather than feeling, and I think that goes back to, you working leashes and me talking and explaining things like there's a lot that trainers dismiss and trying to educate and trying to teach and trying to prove themselves with explaining to their clients feeling. I just told one of our clients today, Rita is working on Jax's out and I sent her some resources for that videos that she can go through. And she messaged me this morning. She was like, Oh my gosh, like I know where we're going wrong with Jax now and I know what to do. She goes, it's just going to take a long time and I've got to be patient. I said, you need to stop and feel your dog. Like we talk about reading the dog. When you're truly reading the dog, it's from here. It's not, it's, you got to feel it. And that's what you do. You feel the dog. That's why you can let these man-eating aggressive dogs just walk out at the end of the leash and come sniff me. And I'm like, Tommy, what are you doing? And you're like, it's fine. It's fine. It's because you feel that dog and their little indicators are not like you're not posturing yourself, being prepared for it. You're watching what's happening. You're responding in the moment with that dog. Well, dogs are in the moment creatures. So if you're predicting self-fulfilled prophecy, it's going to happen. And that's what we see with a lot of our pet owners is, oh, my dog's dog reactive. I see a dog a half mile away. They already start tensing up Mm -hmm. and the dog's like, oh, shit. What, what's going on, mom? Like, what should I be paying attention to? And then the dog lights up at the slightest moment. Well, puppies too. Like puppies are a big one. I feel like so many people nowadays, you either have people that commit to a puppy and they're like, okay, this is going to be a full grown dog. Like I need, I need to get on top of this. Right. And so 
they're too much seriousness, too much control, too right. much. I've got to make sure I contain you. That was like the lady that came in for the eval the other day. She had those two shepherd puppies and they were on the prong collars and they, they were fine. They weren't, they didn't start to jump. They were greeting me. They were super social. I was really excited for them and for the owner. And she immediately started slamming them. And I was like, S they're babies. Love like, puppies. Yeah. And honestly, and what I told her very specific, I was like, if, if I'm a person out in public and I'm willing to greet your dogs and interact with your dogs, I need to be okay with the risk with how old they are of them jumping on me. And if I'm not, then I'm a jerk and it's my problem. Don't correct your dogs. Tell the person to go away. Like, well, and, and I think know. that also depends on the overall arching goal of the dogs. Right. So Raider was never that dog that I allowed just people to meet and greet and pet and things right. like that. He's super social. He loves people, but that wasn't my goal. And with my goal of him being a sport demo dog, I wanted a hundred percent of his attention, his bond, his relationship. And as we see with a lot of pet dogs, the more you allow your dog to interact, meet other people, other dogs, you lose focus. You lose part of that because now it's acceptable. And everybody that your dog meets is like, oh, my new best friend. I need to go say hi to that person. So... I think it's a balancing act and obviously having the control aspect and the release and things like that is going to benefit that. But overall, I mean, I just, dogs don't need dog friends. <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't need other people friends. They don't need, there's so much that we could get into with that. So circling all the way back, you had started talk to, talking about me getting involved in the business. Where were you going with that? <laughs> No, no it was just something to talk about, you know, and, you know, with you, it was different when having just by myself, right? I didn't have anybody else that I was bouncing ideas off of or, you know, had someone that could narrate what I was doing with a dog for a client, um, which has been a huge point for us as far as growth. But I also feel like <clears throat> for a lot of our clients, we hear it all the time, you know, oh, we went to such and such trainer. And I spent a year there and I learned more from you during this free eval than I did the entire year I was with a trainer. Or I, you know, I came out to do bite work and I was with this other couple trainers for massive amounts of time. And in one session, I learned about more about what my dog was doing and what I was doing and how to fix it or make it better or what I was actually doing than I've done this entire time, which just boggles my mind of what what as an industry are we doing? You know, what, what as an industry in the dog community and the dog industry, where is the breakdown in that communication? Because as dog trainers, and maybe that's the problem is that people we're dog trainers. We train dogs. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to train the owner. Yeah. That's so more important than training the dog. Like at your question as an industry, what are we doing? So you say it all the time. The only thing that two dog trainers will agree on is what a third dog trainer is doing wrong. Or, or don't go don't, to dog parks. Don't go to dog parks. <laughs> However, you can't even like broad stroke that because when I was taking Rax and Remy to dog parks before you and I got together and before Remy almost had his first fight at a dog park that made us stop taking, made me stop taking him to dog parks, I, I saw trainers in there. But what are we doing as an industry is like, you watch dog trainers interact a lot of times and it's very much like this is my posture this is what i believe and this is my training th like there's no there are very Be careful few you're gonna get me on the purely positive versus balanced trainers no, no, no. so there's very few trainers though that like can collaborate right and can like they they want to stand on their mountain and not move from it and it's like what how are we benefiting our clients, our human clients and our dog clients in that way? Because just like we've talked about with the purely positive and the force free and all of that stuff, like they have valuable information and they right. have valuable. There was the one trainer that had messaged you the other day and he was talking about um, really being passionate about studying dogs being able to be rehabbed without adverse stimuli or without without having to face negative things 
I listen in a perfect world. Like I would love, I would love to be able to build my confidence and build myself and not have to face anything uncomfortable. That's not the reality of the world that well, we live in. Right. I mean, there's no living creature on this planet that doesn't face some kind of struggle in their life. So to say that a dog ha or can or has to, or is better to not struggle or face some aversion to overcome it, to be a better dog. So I'm going to ice that with some philosophy, right? So like, and it, and I think it's an important distinction with there's no organism on this planet that's going to go through life without struggle. There's this inherent idea in the world today that struggle is bad, right. that struggle is adverse. The only time that struggle is bad or is adverse is when you cannot, what's the word I'm looking for? Assimilate. Uh, when, when you can't get it to come together, when you can't reconcile it, when you can't find benefit to it and how it built you and how it grew you. Like, but if you look at our society too, going off of that, in American society, we're overweight, we're obese, we eat shit food, everything is crap, we're all over medicated, which is a direct reflection of our dogs. Oh gosh. A hundred years ago. Just... A hundred years ago. A <clears throat> hundred years ago, we were farmers. There was no depression because they were all working. They were physical. Right? So So there's this idea though that there was no depression because that was a day and age and a time where you just shut your mouth and sucked it up and dealt with it. Well, I mean, so maybe. not that it didn't exist, but that people didn't discuss it. But they say nowadays, number one way to combat depression is to go to the gym. Right. I mean, I think it's to get out in the sunshine and drink well, more that water, too. <laughs> but you know, they say working out and things like that is a, is the best way to combat depression. Yeah. So, well, what is working out? It's fucking struggle. So, of course, we're going to, as, as the American society, are going to say that our dogs shouldn't struggle because we don't fucking struggle. I mean, and that's the, that's the reality of it. So, <clears throat> and not to get on, like, liberals and Republicans, and because that's a whole other tangent that we could spend hours on, but... You know, those types of people that don't believe in being physically fit, that are okay being overweight, that don't do anything in their lives, they sit in front of TVs, they live sedentary lives, they're the ones that these purely positive trainers sell because, oh, I can just feed my dog treats all day and he doesn't have to go through anything and he'll be fine. I mean, I don't know that we can say that because there's... Well, I just did. Well, I don't know that we can say that truthfully, <laughs> my love. Um, and I say that because I, I think that, well, so if we go back to the guy that he said that, right, he's very invested in doing research and learning and well, and rehab, right. That was one of the very specific things that he had mentioned in that message. How are you rehabbing puppies? Yeah. Because if you go on his actual business page, I don't know, we've met a couple of puppies that need rehab. Well, They've been few and far between. Right. But 99% of the dogs he's trained are puppies. Right. So how are you learning to rehabilitate when you're dealing with an eight to six month old puppy, eight week to six month old puppy? You're not because you're teaching the dog. So ideally you don't have to rehabilitate that dog down the road. Ideally, but it's like you said, but it so, still happens. So we have a toddler and yes, I know she's not a puppy. I'm very well aware that my toddler's not a puppy. However, you'd be very surprised at how much... <laughs> How much dog they training correlate. applies to, yeah, applies to child rearing. Just don't tell mom because she got mad at you last time you said that. Well, you know, um, positive and rewarding is fantastic to teach behaviors. Correct. Or we reward live, behaviors. We, right. We live in a natural world where there are natural inclinations to test the limits and there are things that are good. There are things that are bad, incorrect regardless of what ideology like there are or things species. that are going to be beneficial or advantageous and it, that experimentation you can never stop behaviors with positive only and i would i would even beg to say that from what we've seen 
I'd say at least 80% of our clients that come through our training programs need our training because their dog has no idea what no means and they don't know how to tell the dog no. And there's some times where I'm like, oh my gosh, like if you would have just taught them no, like we have to give words meaning to our dogs. And so I have not met one single person that has had a relationship with a dog where they haven't had to tell that dog no about something because the reality is there was a trainer that said this and I was actually like, I have deep, deep respect for this statement right here. And it was the understanding that we're asking animals to survive in a human world. So you get into that. We won't even talk about Blackfish and how that movie like completely showed that positive reinforcement only is not an end all be all like that cannot be the, the stool that you stand on the mountain that you stand on and have it be true in a hundred percent of cases. Like you have to have negative reinforcement to an extent. Well, every, if you have positive, you have negative. So even though they say they're purely positive trainers, they're still withholding rewards. Yeah. So the idea is like the negative is inherent rather than positive correction or we're, we are administering. And that works great discipline. for humans. Right. But it's a predator. Well, and so the human aspects, like we talk to clients all the time, it's like, I can think about my thoughts. Correct. I can sit here and go, you know, a burrito sounds really good right now. Right. Why does a burrito sound good? Yeah, Joey needs to make some pizza order or something. No, (laughs) I'm kidding. Why does a burrito... Like, I can think about my thoughts. The other thing that makes us different is that we can project possible future outcomes. Correct. So I can project that after we wrap up this podcast, you're going to be exhausted and you're going to want to take a nap or you're going to want to go get lunch or this is going to go so long that we're just going to have to rush on to the next thing. Like, I know there are possibilities... The dog is very in the moment. And so like science has studied, what is our prefrontal cortex? It's the decision making area of our brain and ours is bigger. Like, I don't know how much more basic we can get. We're the bigger brain. And, and so we have to lead it. But that trainer had mentioned, you know, the purely positive aspect and the animal trainer side of things with zoos and other institutions that have wild animals. That's one thing those animals don't have to exist in a human world and our pet dogs do. And one of the things that he pointed out was that there, there are dogs that are dog aggressive that live in high rises in New York that have to be able to be okay getting into an elevator and getting off of an elevator when dogs can be present. There's only so much you can do to control the environment. And so, and I think that it's good and fair to teach the dog how to exist in the world. Like, well, it has to. And, you know, and I, and I feel like one of the big arguments that people have with the purely positive thing is, well, it works in the zoo. You can take a lion or a tiger and with a clicker, make him put his arm out so that you can draw blood. They're also working for their food. Well, they won't feed them. Right. Until they comply with the behaviors. Right. So that's a huge key that the purely positive or some of those trainers, maybe it's not just purely positive, and those balance trainers that will fast or starve dogs till they're food motivated. Um, but that's something that's not generally told to the general public is, and it, and it comes from Skinner, right? So Skinner was the psychiatrist or psychiatrist, psychologist, 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 whatever. I can't talk. Um, who kind of developed the whole operant and classical conditioning thing. Well, Pablo did classical. He did operant. Skinner did operant. And essentially, he created the Skinner box. And it was just a little box. And what he would do was he would starve birds so they were almost dead and then put them in this box and make them interact with something. He would click with a clicker or some kind of auditorial marker and then feed them bird feed. And he denounced that, you know, you can free shape these behaviors with purely positive, but it's not, I mean, I'm sorry, starving a dog is not purely positive. That's negative. (laughs) And and not in reality, that is, if you go off the operant conditioning, you know, four quadrants, that would be negative punishment because you're taken away. Mm -hmm. So, but that's. Purely positive sounds great, but it's not a real thing. 
So. Yeah, we can't get into the quadrants conversation because that just gets so... <clears throat> it depends upon what... And that's the thing. Depends like, on who's talking about it. I love lately getting back to... Yeah, because depending upon who's talking about it, positive punishment, am I adding punishment for some trainers? Right. Negative punishment, am I taking away the punishment? Or am I taking away something to punish? Right. Which are directly inverse and opposite right. things. So it's like, I love lately, you know, losing Remy and, and putting him down like that. I realized a lot with that and it's trickling over to danger. And I love it because it made me realize how much I've been withholding my relationship with the dog. And you've told me you're like, danger has a relationship with you. The relationship isn't the problem. You're the problem. You've got to have a relationship with the dog. And so all of this, like, do you remember being in our garage and super in the weeds? Like I grabbed out the dry erase marker. I drew the operant quadrants on and I'm like, okay, help me sort this out. And then we went to, then we went to Nipopo and listen to Bart and Michael explain it. And yeah, then I came to realize like, it's all how people are processing screw all of that crap. Like, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be a good human with the best intentions that I have for my dog to build discipline and have a loving relationship with them. But a loving relationship also means boundaries. Correct. And so all of that other stuff, aside, which is also between humans and everything else, like yes. you can't just go through life willy nilly. And I mean, you can, Oh well, yeah, I mean, you can, there but there are you people will be, out there. I, I mean, we do at times. True. We do at times. We give and give and give and give and give and. Well, and you end up empty and then it ends up causing you to be closed off right. and not like not want to give. And then, and then other people become enemies and it becomes this like, well, you did this to me and you did that to me. And really what it comes down to is we did it to ourselves, not being able to, to have the confidence the to say, Hey, like I'm, I'm on. I'm on red in my battery right now. Like I've got nothing to, I want to give. I want to give so bad, but I'm on red in my battery and I just can't. Which you're way better at doing than I am. I don't, I don't, maybe I'm better at it because <laughs> I do it too much. And so you have to balance me out. That's like the weirdest thing with relationships, marriage, marriage, especially. Well, yeah. I mean, we're the exact opposite of each other. I think over the last couple of years, though, we've been getting better. Like, I'm noticing more balance between us. Like, you just talked about all the way to the left, all the way to the right, and then you find the center. Yeah, I, I especially over the last year. Well, yeah, we've had a lot of time to bounce from polar opposites and back and forth to find the balance point. We well, also moved all the way clear away from ever So we've spent a whole lot more time together and not distracted with other relationships and not avoiding coming together and figuring this out. I don't know. The boundaries thing super easy for me because it's safe. I have more control this way. And you're just like, yeah, here's a crate. Yeah, here, borrow the van. Yeah, here, yeah, here. I'm like, Tommy, what are you, what are you doing? You're gonna, you're gonna, ah, oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And then the van comes back wrecked and you're like. And the kennel never comes back and everything else that I've given and given and given and I just get shit on for. Well, so, and this is like, but we do have some, uh, I, I, I won't say I get shit on every time because we have cultivated a lot of really great relationships because of me being very giving and. Well, and this goes back to like my hope and my faith thing that you got frustrated about and talked to my mom about is like, I don't think that people intentionally shit on other people. I think that when people shit on other people or people shit on each other, this sounds disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> when. I think that it just becomes like they get so wrapped up in the survival side that it's, it's just a selfishness. And I don't mean selfishness in the negative connotation that like society has. It's that self, they get wrapped up in the self preservation, self -preservation right. thing. And so I don't, and I think that's one of the big things that's different about like you and I, and that whole dream team thing is like, you have always felt like there are no bad dogs. 
there are no bad dogs. And other people come back with that with like, no, there's just bad owners. I don't. And that's where we balance. I don't think there's bad owners because, and, and I, it's was, uneducated owners. Yeah. And so that's, and that's what I told somebody the other day we were talking and they said that. And I was like, you know, the first time that I come across somebody where I give them information that they fully understand, they fully conceptualize, they've seen that information applied and they've seen the results come to fruition. And that person comes back and says, yeah, I'm not doing that. Like that doesn't work. And they just totally deny reality. Oh, like our trainers when we were telling them how to do things and they just kind of said, no, we're not going to do it that way. Yeah. Well, so that would be a bad owner, <laughs> right? Like that. I've never seen that. Yeah. I have never seen somebody that if, if I don't do my job to explain it in a way that you can conceptualize and understand and apply it or even see the results happen and you don't go about doing it, that doesn't mean that you're a bad owner. It's, it means that I failed in my teaching job. So I had that happen a handful of times in the first couple of years that I was a dog trainer where owners just blatantly said, I'm not doing that. And it wasn't oh, anything. Sometimes you have to sell them on doing it for sure. Well, no. And it wasn't like, it wasn't anything crazy and it wasn't anything like, it was like, okay, you need to put your dog in a kennel because your dog's destroying your house. And he chewed through the wall and into the living room through the wall and almost got the electrical cable that he would underneath. I'm sorry, it's not funny, but it's funny. And it's like, so how do I train my dog to not do that when I'm not at home? Well, you can't because you, unless you're going to put electrical, you know, hot fence through your wall. So your dog gets electrocuted. The dog's not supervised. So you can't educate the dog. So put the dog in a kennel. That's the safest thing. Oh, I refuse. I, I will never put my dog in a kennel. Well, then why are we having this conversation? See, but that's where things have changed over the last couple of years, because now you will stop and go, okay, you're not. Why? Why won't you put your dog in a kennel? Oh, so like maybe I've matured there. and I've developed a little more <laughs> and maybe I'm just addressing things a little bit different now. So, but that's the thing, right? And like, that's what we've been talking to people lately about too is, or at least I have been, I don't think that like, I think that all of us, every single person that owns a dog has the best intentions, at least when they go into it. Now, someone might go into getting a dog and that dog ends up chained up in the backyard and staying in its own mess and in the weather and the person just kind of like out of sight, out of mind. We can get into that. I, I, I think it's, I think it's people being wrapped up in trauma, people being wrapped up in that self-preservation thing. I don't think that they don't have the best intentions for their dog. I think they're stuck in a rock in a hard place where they're like, oh shit. I don't have what this creature needs right? and I don't Let have alone any, themselves, but I'm going to get judged and ridiculed if I go to surrender this dog or the shelters are full or, and so they just, they end up frozen. They end up stuck and it's what is freeze fight, fight, flight, freeze, fawn freeze is self-preservation survival mechanism. And so I think that there's been so much magic that has happened and just honoring that people have the best of intentions, but they end up stuck in self-preservation, that there are no bad dogs, just misinformation and so much misinformation out there. Well, yeah. And so the other problem that we run into too is every rescue dog you train has been abused. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we're creating a cycle of there are bad owners because they're abusing dogs, which is why this dog was dropped off here. And I'm sorry. And, the almost 10 years I've been doing this, I think I've maybe seen one or two real abuse cases. Right. Neglect is different, like 100% neglect, yeah. but not like physical abuse, hitting dogs, things like that. And unfortunately, that's all created through the rescue communities trying to rehome backyard bred dogs. Yeah. And you don't, you don't know what you don't know. Right. The perfect example that I can think of with that was Sapphire and Valor. Those two male puppies that we got, Sapphire was on point. That dog was super confident. She was super curious about her environment. And they both came from the same 
litter. Correct. Valor was very skeptical. He was very weirded out. They were raised the same way. They had the same interactions because they were in a kennel with their mom pretty much their whole life. Well, until eight weeks. Right. And then they got pulled out. And then we took them. Yeah. But it, you had two completely opposite dogs. Polar opposite. Well, except for their drives were pretty, Valor's drive was a little bit higher, but, and, and he was never abused. Right. He was never mistreated. We never hit him. We never did anything. But when you went to go pet him, it took a long time for me to desensitize him to my hand coming over his head. And this is the thing going back to trying to teach without exposed to adverse stimuli. So the idea is I put my hand over this dog's head and he like dips and shies away in one theory that trainer goes, okay, well, the dog doesn't like that. I'm not going to expose him to it. And don't get me wrong. I don't believe in flooding. (laughs) Like I don't believe in flooding. I'm not going to sit there and be like, put up with it, bro. And get over it. Like, but what I am going to do is put my hand over his head. And when he shies away, I'm going to wait and let, I'm going to freeze in that moment. I'm just going to slow down and stop and watch the dog. And the minute that he backs out or the minute that his nose starts going and he starts, he starts interacting with the environment and it always first starts with the nose for the dog go over when his nose starts going, I'm going to give him a treat. I'm going to wait until that decision happens. I can't touch him or pet him or coddle him when he's like, Oh shit, what's going on. But over time, because the reality is with me being the bigger brain, this that dog's life is not in danger. Correct. His physical safety is not in danger. Well, and that's like that dude, the same guy screenshot of the video that I took of. Yeah. Stitch. Stitch. Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh, look at this dumb person. He doesn't even see the body language and he's such a bad trainer. And I'm probably over exaggerating what he said, but I was kind of pissed off. I'm so. just smiling because I love how sensitive you are. <clears throat> yeah. Um, <laughs> And it's like, okay, so let's break this down. So yes, the dog was scared. The dog was shying away. The dog was licking his lips. Dog wasn't making eye contact. Dog wanted nothing to do with me being there. Got it. Who cares? Because the dog has to get over it. Yeah. You're such a man. (laughs) It's such a man. But here's the thing, right? So I didn't flood the dog. No, no, no. I touched I mean, him. He wasn't comfortable with it, but I also didn't allow him to make a decision that would go to violence. Yes. And so that's what I mean by like your reaction of who cares. It's very just at the bottom of the barrel. There's no nuances, no. And it comes but like. It doesn't have to be. I mean, I guess for some people that are analytical like you that want to take all the end an- or want all the answers and all the finite details. Cool. But Why? The dog needs to stop biting people. The dog needs to stop being scared. So the only way I can get past it is, dude, I don't care about your feelings. You need to choose something besides violence today. I think I just like playing in colors instead of black and white. One well, like, color blind, so shut up. <laughs> and that's that's what I mean by like, you're just a man. Either I care, and if I care, I'm going to do something about it. Like that's a very man thing. If I care, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to take some type of well, affirmative action. I mean, obviously, I care because if I didn't care, I wouldn't be trying to save the dog. Right. Right. But I don't care about your feelings in that moment because we're trying to accomplish something. And this is something I tell clients all the time. Owners, pet owners, get their dogs from an emotional standpoint. Right. You get this dog to be your buddy, your companion, your house pet, right? So we're emotionally involved with our pet dogs. Right. As a dog trainer, when I take that dog to train, yes, I have a finite amount of emotional connection that I try to create because I need trust. Mm-hmm. But I'm coming at this objectively because I have X amount of time that I have to accomplish what I've set out to accomplish. So I come at this very objectively. So when we do this go home lesson, when the dogs go home, it's very difficult for a lot of pet owners to become more objective than emotional. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I tell people is like, we don't want to lose the reason why we got our dog because what's the point? Yeah. The relationship, the relationship, the emotional side of it. Right. Because otherwise what's the point, but we have to be objective enough 
to correct, reward, and understand what the dog is going through so we can progress the dog forward. Only if you want a dog that behaves. Correct. <laughs> like, if you don't give a crap, then it doesn't matter. Right. But then you're wasting a ton of money in my time. Well, yeah. There's, yeah, so on the, like, who cares? I think developing with the more words thing, because me and words, is not so much who cares, it's your feelings, Stitch's feelings in that moment were unfounded. There right. was no logical or reasonable reason right. for it. And this goes to what we talk to our dog aggressive clients about, right? And like, he was another one that was at a home from a puppy, was never abused, mm -hmm. never hit, lack of socialization, lack of environmental stabilization, lack of training communication. But a dog, like that video... And it's, it's on our social media. Like we don't have very many dogs that we've trained named Stitch. You can go look at the video. Yeah, I don't think there's like more than one. <laughs> but if you watch the video, like honestly, you got to watch all of the videos that Tommy had posted about the whole thing. Because this dog, like seeing that very initial video. Of him trying to eat me in the kennel. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, you petting him and him being um, all like curled up in himself. Well, like, day one, he was trying to eat me in the kennel. Well, um, but what people didn't know is that dog was there because he wanted to murder his brother. Right. So in all of this, like, oh my gosh, the dog's so scared and he's so worried. And what are you doing? That, that dog wanted to murder his brother and his family was like, Hey, listen, we're, I'm, we're not getting rid of our dogs. It's right. not happening. Um, yeah. So it goes back to, though, to like those emotions, those feelings are unfounded. Right. Dog aggressive clients. We tell our dog aggressive clients all the time, the dog aggressive dog clients. We tell them all the time, we will get your dog neutral. We will get them environmentally neutral, non-reactive. When they come back to you, you're probably most of the problem. And so we're going to coach you to get the same results, right? That's the whole point behind it. It's like, it's great if I can handle your dog. It's a major ego hit. If I can make your dog look like a rock star. And as soon as I hand the leash over, they're just going ballistic and I can't teach you how to get the same thing out of your dog that I can. Right. But we tell them all of the time, we'll get them neutral. If you've got a dog that's going to bum rush you on your walk and they get into a certain threshold, it is unfair to expect your dog not to defend itself. Correct. Like that is not, those are emotions that are founded. Right. But if the dog is 15 feet away on leash with another handler that is safe and that is going, yeah, your dog doesn't need to react. It's being able to discern the environment and how to actually react to what's present and not what you think is going to happen. But they also have to trust the handler, the owner. Yeah. Because if that's not there, then it's still founded that I can't trust you to protect me. Oh, the dog has to trust Correct. the owner. Yeah. Well, that's where the coaching and the mentoring right. after the fact comes in. But that's still a process. And that's where this generation of instant gratification or instant satisfaction doesn't happen with those types of dogs. Right. Which yeah. is why they, we do the lifetime support. And we hope that they come out for the follow-ups and all that kind of stuff. Because, like Henry? Right. So Henry came in. He's been home for two weeks. And we, didn't, we saw one aggression outburst in training. Mm-hmm. It took one correction. And then he came back yesterday. Well, his go home was a mess. Well, the end of the go home was a mess. Right. And, but that was, the, the dog was already drained. He was already tired. Oh, like, I didn't realize he was passing Yeah, threshold. that was, <laughs> that dog came in at the perfect storm point where the dog, where Henry was already tired. Owners were already overworked. Everything was just, it was bad timing. Um, but since going home, he has struggled. He's done great with everything except for other dogs. He's not growling or barking at other people. They can walk by bicycles now. They can walk by cars. Everything other than his obedience is even more on point than what it was before. And his obedience was really good before. Mm -hmm. The only thing they were struggling with was the dog reactivity, which they felt like was getting more pronounced. Yeah. Right. And, you know, we had a call, I think, last week with him. And I gave him some pointers and stuff like that. And, you know, my big thing with the e-collar training is we don't use the e-collar to stop aggression. Right. Right. Yeah. And they got to the point where they didn't have a choice. They tried to use the e-collar and all it did was ramp them up. So yesterday mm -hmm. we 
we came on the training floor, Henry and his dad did some obedience. And I started with Raider, super calm, mellow dot, we're not calm, but in control, right? Yeah. Raider, crazy Malinois. Um, I mean, for a Malinois, he's pretty calm. He's also nine now. <laughs> um, so had him out there, no reaction out of Henry. Obedience was great. He was looking, but there was no reaction. Put him away, brought out, I forget who the second dog was that I brought out. Annie? No, Annie was the th- third dog. There was one movie between Annie and Raider, and Annie's the one that Henry lit up on during the go-home lesson. Mm-hmm. And he spiked up a little bit, but it wasn't anything the owner really had to do much about. It was a couple like, no, don't do that. And Henry just flowed back into position. I brought out Muggsy. Oh, yeah. And he lost it. So, but I prepped him with Which the is slip so lead. weird because Muggsy is so sweet. And, and she, just well, she wanted to play. There. She was uh, bouncing all okay. over the place and barking at him. You know, just happy-go-lucky puppy that's all over 100 pounds. You know, he's like, you feel comfortable being yourself. Get away from me. (laughs) And so I prepped Henry's dad with what to do and he did it. And instantly Henry knocked the crap off, fell right into place. Even with Muggsy still going berserk and me barely being able to hold her. Was Henry shut down and scared? No. How do you know? Reading the body language, right? That's what everybody's like. Okay. He stopped, but was he oppressed? No. So, because he understood, the communication was there, right? He got knocked out of that that black zone, that red zone, the tunnel vision, because of what I told his owner to do, and all of a sudden, there was clarity. And then Henry's looking at Dad going, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, cool. Well, and he understood because of, like, I, I really, like, the further that we get into this and we start, like, picking out, like, what makes us different? Why are we so... Why are we so successful at this? And I don't like... Well, because in the first couple of years of me doing dog training, I'd trained probably three times as many dogs in that time period that most trainers touch. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, there are ideology pieces and beliefs that we have that are integrated. And like my... Uh, well, we train the dog. I wanted, I've wanted to discover what those are. And one of the big pieces is that teaching the dog how to control themselves, right? teaching the dog that their behaviors have consequences, whether those are positive or negative consequences. It's not me. I am the one that is responsible because I'm, I'm the one that's responsible for delivering the information because I'm the bigger brain. So I am responsible for stepping up and being the authority in the partnership, in the relationship with my dog. But I should be I should be one for one doling out positives or negatives communicating with my dog, whether that was acceptable or unacceptable, or it's just neutral. You're just free being a dog. Context is everything too. Like context is huge. Well, and I feel like the reason we stand out is we actually started this company to train dogs and humans. We didn't start this company to make money and to create a program or a cookie cutter stamp for every single dog that comes through our kennel or through our training programs. Right. We didn't just see the dollar signs available in the training industry and be like, hey, look, Correct. we can. We actually we can- wanted, and which, which is the whole reason why we opened the facility that we opened and that we have is we want a training facility, mm-hmm. not a boarding facility. Right. You go to most of these dog training companies and it's 10% training space or lobby space the trainers work in and the rest of it's all boarding. Right. We didn't want that. We wanted a place that we could actually train and do things with dogs mm-hmm. versus making a ton of money by having oh, I mean, shoot, one of the, the big box kennel here, some of their facilities can hold 500 dogs. Mm-hmm. But all they do is cookie cut. Well, and we were talking, what was it? Oh, Danielle was going through resumes the other day and she was like, oh my gosh, knows how to handle 20 to 35 dogs at a time individually. Are you serious? And I was like, yeah, that's not like, that's not uncommon, 
For a place set up like we are in a commercial space with a kennel, it is not uncommon for a trainer to have to run through 20 to 30 dogs. To make a living. Yeah. To make but a they're living. also doing five 10 minute sessions that aren't very quality and they have to teach five commands throughout two or three weeks. I mean, so they it. still get decent results, but I feel like that's why the harder cases we, we end up seeing them right. and they say, Hey, I've been to this, 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 where they've been at least to one other training place. And they're like, it was good. My dog got something out of it, but there are things missing. Right. I feel like we just, or like the dogs that we did eval last night for. Oh yes. Yeah. They had, they've already been through training. The one dog's already certified therapy dog. And when they did their lesson with the trainer for the big box company, it was a 15 minute lesson. Right. And it's like, dude, how are you going to smash in two or three weeks worth of training into 15 minutes? Just right. my academic portion for most of our clients is an hour, hour and 20, depending upon the dog and the situation. Well, that's what everybody like staff that we've brought on that's worked for other companies or even people that have gone to other training companies and then found us like that's one of the big things. Everybody's like, oh, my gosh, your go home lesson for your board and trains is two or three hours long. Well, and it's so informative. A right. majority of it is us sitting down talking concepts and getting people right. to understand. Well, because the dogs, dogs are easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting the, the owner to be on, t on task or on par or whatever and actually do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. So, and I guess that's probably what makes us different than everybody else. Well, and I think that we don't, we don't have that. We understand people's. Now I do. It used to be really frustrating. Someone coming in and just, my dog won't do this or my dog does that. Like they have absolutely no control of it. Right. And I used to like, it used to take a lot for me to not respond very shitty and very judgmentally. Um, I think that that's just kind of a growth point though, because originally it didn't bother me. And then I got to a point where I kind of got jaded and I was like, well, I mean, who's in charge here? But there's so much information out there that's like for us to do the best by our dogs, we have to let them be in charge. And by honoring who they are as a dog we and us letting them be in charge, like that's what's fair. Well, and that's why we have furries in high school now. And so, gosh, there are things, there are things that I just. So I think it's a good point to leave. <laughs>